talked about waiting for the coming of the Lord. It's not passive. I thought about that as we were singing. It's not like sitting in the doctor's office or the emergency room waiting. It's like you've prepared a big picnic and a banquet and you're busily awaiting the guests, but you're actively preparing for that, for the guests that are to come. And Whenever you read the scripture, every time it says, wait upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, you go back to the original language, the word wait is never sitting. The word waiting upon the Lord is always an active word. You're doing something in response to what God is already doing in our lives. Sometimes when you're waiting, the activity that God will do in your life is He'll ask you to go someplace you hadn't planned to go. You ever had that happen? He'll ask you to talk to somebody that you never planned on talking to or you really don't want to talk to. You ever had that happen? He'll ask you to do something that you really don't want to do. You ever had that happen? Have you ever had to go any place that you didn't really want to go, but you did it for some reason out of obligation? Or maybe you did it because you loved the people who wanted you to be with them? I had one of those experiences recently, and I'm not sure what my motive was. I haven't been able to assess that. Um, I attended... Or I went, or I was dragged to, I'm not sure how to describe it, to Comic-Con 23, Kansas City. <laughs> Mercy is right. My daughter said, I can't believe he did that. How? What possessed him? And I tell you, I haven't got my reservations in for next year. I have not done that. I thought I was going to a Star Trek convention, and my daughter reminded me that she told me it was going to be a whole lot more than that, but somehow I didn't hear that. I just heard we were going to a Star Trek convention, and Lisa's a Star trek -y fan, and so I'm going to do this because she's wanted to do this for a lifetime, and besides, William Shatner was going to be there, and, and Frankie, whoever what his name is, Riker, I don't know all these characters. They were all going to be there, okay? They're going to talk. I don't know what they're going to talk about, but maybe I can get a sermon illustration out of one of those guys somewhere. And so we went. Can I tell you that when we showed up and I parked into the parking garage in downtown Kansas City at the convention center, what I saw going into the convention center was not Trekkie fans. It was all kinds of people dressed up in all kinds of costumes, some of them in nothing much more than their developed birthday suit. And they were walking into this convention center, and I'm going, what in the world? There must be another convention going on here. It can't be just Trekkie fans. And when I walked in, and I saw the long line, and we walk up to every uh, go up the escalator into the big convention hall. I didn't see anything of Star Trek. What I saw from, see, from, from the floor to the ceiling was stacks of boxes of Pokemon and all kinds of animated creatures that looked like they came out of a horror movie. And I'm thinking, what in the world am I into? And the crowd is just wild. And then I saw this uh, sign. I don't know if we have it on the screen here this morning. The sign, the cosplay. They're, they're all dressed up in cosplay. And I, I'm looking at this sign. Please keep your hands to yourself. You have to go to a convention. They tell you that. In every, I've never been to a convention. They said keep your hands to yourself. If you'd like to take a picture with one or another of the fans, always ask first and respect the person's right to say no. Be respectful. Be nice. Be cool. And be kind to each other. And go, what kind of a party is this? They have to tell you how to behave. Where can I get one of these signs for the church out here? Come in here, please. Well, I don't know how we do all of that. And all these creatures are standing there, and I'm elbowed and getting elbowed by all kinds of creatures. I felt like I had been dropped onto another planet. 
So I walked around and finally made my way, and then we finally made it into the convention hall, and we had to get our seats, and we had to wait through several other speakers, and, and finally it was time for Will Shatner, but before, that was, but before that was finally over, here came a guy, and there was one chair between me and the next person, and then Lisa and, and Bethany and all of us were sitting here, and they were narrow chairs to begin with, and we're just, we're just kind of in here like this. And this guy comes over, and he just plops down right in that chair. Can I tell you that he overflowed into my lap? I kept moving this way. And I found myself, before it was over, sitting between the two chairs on metal frames. That's real comfortable. And the metal legs. And I'm sitting there, and he keeps doing this. And I finally took all I could take, and I said to Lisa, I'm going to find some place in the outer 40 over here where there's not many people, and I'm going to sit there. I finally made my way into that. Then it was time to go get your picture with William Shatner. Okay, he sounded pretty good. He, he talked about everything and then walked off the stage crying and begging us to do something about climate change. And he went to the back floor. We went on to our way into the place where there. And I, here's what I thought. I thought we were paying 130 bucks to walk into a nice little room for two or three minutes, get to say hi, have a little chat with William Shatner, get our picture taken and walk out. Oh, no. They started yelling at us, this way, this way, for pictures. And they lined us up 20 lines across in between narrow yellow lines about this narrow. I've always wondered what cattle felt like at the packing plant on their way waiting for the shoot. We were lined up. I mean, you literally could not turn around. You could not move. And we stood there just like this for 40 minutes waiting our turn to go behind some prepared curtains where we were going to get our picture with William Shatner. I was holding out hope that at least when we got behind the curtains, we could talk to him, wave, have a, have a minute or two, and, and go our way. Oh, no. There was the barking voices of the ushers. Move this way. Hurry up. Hurry up. Move, 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 move. We were ushered into the place, and as I walked into the curtain, there he is, Will, William Shatner, sitting on a stool on the other side of the plexiglass. There was no wave, there's no conversation, and it was hurry up, hurry up, get it lined up, get it lined up, get one shot, one shot at this, one shot, and click, click, and this is the picture we got within seconds. Don't I look happy? I look really happy there, don't you think? I'm having a good time. Can you tell? I'm having a wonderful time. And that was it. Get out of here, get out of here, get out of here, move, 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 move. We got more coming through, and they ushered us out. I have to tell you that by the time I got into the middle of the afternoon, I had to fight off Captain America, Iron Man, Ant-Man, Cobalt Man, Wonder Woman, Titanium Man, Psycho Man, Thor, and Dragon Man to get out of there. And I've just concluded that if anybody is a superhero, I'm the superhero. I got it out of there and fought all of those superheroes, and they ought to be lining up to get my picture with me and pay the $13,000 for the 30 minutes that we all paid to get our picture with William Shatner. Well, I haven't even bothered to find out when next year's convention is. I have no plans to go. That's a once-in-a-lifetime experience. <laughs> There's a guy in the Bible who ended up going to a place he didn't want to go. God showed up one day in his life, and he was sitting around, and God showed up and said, I want you to go over to a city about 500 miles from where you live. I want you to uh, give them a message to that city. I want you to give them a message of warning, and I want you to give them a message of hope and deliverance. This, this man got up and went but not where he was told to go. He didn't want to go there. In fact, he took an incredible detour. And in fact, he, he, he doesn't want to go anywhere. He's being asked to go to a city called Nineveh. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a Comic Con planet of some sort, too. And God says, I want you to, I want you to do that. But instead, Jonah calls his travel agent and he books a cruise on the Mediterranean, a Mediterranean cruise. 
And he takes off. He doesn't go to Nineveh. In fact, he goes 2,000 miles in the opposite direction to Spain to a place called Tarshish. 2,500 miles deliberately in the wrong, in the opposite direction from what God had told him to go to Nineveh. And he admitted it. In fact, he told all the crew when he got on the cruise ship, he said, I'm running from God. I don't want to be, he'll go where he wants me to go. And so they didn't know what his religion was. They didn't understand his religion. And, and so they just took it in stride. And, and so he goes down to his, his deck and and he goes into his room, and he's fast asleep, thinking, man, I'm getting away, and I won't have to go where God wants me to go. I'm not going there. And the Bible tells us that God sent a big storm, and it hit the boat. And all the crew began to pray to their gods of all their religions. And then they realized that maybe they began to play the blame game. Whose fault is it that the storm come? Who, who's got us into trouble here? Who's done something? Who's hiding something? And so they went down in, in the room and knocked on the door and got Jonah up and said, what's, do you know anything about what's going on here? And Jonah said, yeah, it's probably you're in a storm because of me. They said, what are we going to do? He said, well, I want you all, well, pray to your God that he'll deliver us. And Jonah said, well, probably what you're going to have to do is you're probably going to have to take me and throw me overboard. I don't know what Jonah was thinking. Is he thinking, hey, this is, this is a way to get out of this without having to commit suicide. Somebody else will do it. They get the blame. Well, they caught on real fast because the Bible says the crewmen said, no, 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 we don't want to have your blood on our hands. And they begin to pray to the God of heaven, don't hold this against us. We don't know who this man is. We don't know who you are, but we don't want to be have this blood. We don't want bad luck coming to us because we throw this man overboard. But Jonah insisted, and they finally threw him overboard. And he's thinking, good, I get to die. I'd rather die then go where God is asking me to go, to Nineveh. But God sends a big fish. Swallows up Jonah. And I'll let you try to picture that. Seaweed around his neck. Digestive juices swirling him. He's conscious. He can't move. And he's praying to God. I think I'd be praying to God too. Conscious in the fish. And he's praying that God will somehow deliver him out of that situation. And it's a very odd situation that finally even the fish can't stand the meal. There's nothing more nauseous than the prophet of God who's running from God. There's nothing more nauseous. And the Bible says the big fish vomited up Jonah on the land. So now what's Jonah going to do? Well, God comes again and says, the call is still on. Just because you tried to run doesn't cancel the call. The call is still in your life. We're now days and weeks later, but the call is still on your life. And I'm not going to stop calling you. To go to Nineveh. And the Bible says that Jonah gets up and he goes. This time he goes to Nineveh. But he doesn't go with a heart of obedience. He goes in compliance. Do you know the difference between a heart of obedience and a compliant heart? That just does what he got to do because it got to do it. Because it got to keep up my image. There's a difference between obedience from the heart and compliance. And Jonah goes, but he's concocting his whole thing. How am I going to handle this? I don't like these people. And then he begins to think about the message that God gives him. And he says, well, this is good news because I can preach this hellfire and brand, brimstone judgment on these people. And God's going to wipe them out. And I'll have a front row theater seat with, with free tickets. And so the Bible says that he went. He goes to Nineveh and it takes him three days in street meetings to, to reach the whole city and he preaches to them the judgment of God that's coming because of their sins unless they repent. 
but he doesn't think they'll listen, and he doesn't think they'll repent because they're bad boys. They're wicked, evil people. Their culture's gone to, to pot. They're not going to recover from this. They're, it's over. Their politics are corrupt. Everything's corrupt in their lives, and surely they will never hear this. And so he finishes his preaching, and he walks out to the edge of the city up on a hill, and he sits under a little vine tree, and he waits for God to drop the bombs on Nineveh, and he's going to enjoy every minute of it. Well, you know the story if you've read it. The tree wilts. Jonah gets mad. He's angry at God for letting the shade, that he, the only shade on a hot summer day, the only shade he has. He's yelling and screaming at God. And we pick up the final story in chapter of Jonah. And listen to the conversation. Because what happened was not what Jonah thought was going to happen. Nineveh heard the message and repented. They changed their mind. They put their own sackcloth and ashes. And the, and the king stood up in the, in the palace and said, let's all have a day of repentance. And we're going to change as a nation. We're going to change the way we're living. And we're going to start serving the God of Jonah. They had a revival. It was an incredible experience. But listen to Jonah's conversation in chapter 4, verse 1. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you'd do this? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I've predicted doesn't happen. And the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Have you ever had the Lord ask you about that when you're all upset about something? What do you get upset about? Is it right for you to be angry about this? And Jonah went out to the east side of the city, made a shelter, sat under it, waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. And it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. And the sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because a plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Wow. Wow. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry for a plant. Though you did nothing to put it there, it came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. Or the literal language says they don't know their right hand from their left hand. Does that sound like the culture we live in? They don't know. They don't know. They can't see their right hand from their left hand. They don't know what they're doing. Should I not feel sorry for such a great city? And the book ends. Fascinating to me, it's one of the very few books in the Bible in which God is talking and he ends with a question and it isn't answered. It's as if he is letting us decide in our own lives how we will finish the answer to his question. It raises the question for all of us, what does concern you and me? What disturbs you? What do you cry about? What do you get upset about? What do you rant and rave about in your life? What disturbs you? What causes you to get up and take action and speak? Because they shouldn't be doing that and we can't have this anymore. What is it that stirs you? In fact, maybe so angry that you wish you could just die. You don't want to be here anymore. Maybe you've even thought about suicide. 
you're so angry. But the ultimate peace for you is to just check out. And yet for Jonah, the, the distress is shocking. The story ends rather strangely. Instead of Jonah rejoicing and praising God for what's going on in Nineveh and how God is working in their lives, he becomes angry and concerned and distressed over a plant and the repentance of the people and a revival. And I want us to see several things in this as we're praying our way toward Pentecost and looking at this whole business of mission matters to God. The call of God to his disciples when Jesus went back to heaven was to go, or literally, in your daily routine of going, make disciples, make followers of Jesus. That's his call to the church. That's his call to us. But we have a problem in our culture. I came across recently Barna Research. George Barna has been a, a well-known statistician in the um, Christian movement in the church over the last 30 or 40 years. They did a recent survey that 47%, almost half of practicing Christians who responded in the survey believe right now in our culture, that it is wrong, it is intrusive, it is rude to evangelize or to share your faith in Christ Jesus. Maybe you're one of those this morning. You think that's kind of rude. We just need to shut up. If people want to get saved, they'll come to us. They'll bring it up. But the funny thing about this research was in a question right following that, 65% believe, the same folks that took the survey, 65% believe that being a witness about Jesus is an important part of their faith. Uh-oh, we got to disconnect. It's rude, it's wrong to share our faith, but we should be witnesses for Jesus. How do you put those two together? How do you reconcile that with the great commission of Jesus? Go and, and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How is that going to happen if there's no one telling the good news of Jesus in the culture? And I think it calls us back to the story of, of the life of Jonah in which we need to be reminded of three things. The first one is this. We need to be reminded, we need to realize that lost people still matter to God. Amen? Amen? Do we believe that? Do we believe that lost people really matter to God? Do you believe that your lost children who are away from church and from Jesus today, that are lost, that they matter to God? Your neighbors, your spouse that is lost, that is not living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Do you, do you understand that, that their lives matter to God? The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, 8, that God came and sent, showed his great love for us by sending Christ in that while we were, watch this, yet sinners... Christ died for us. Do you catch that? God sent his son when we were sinners. He had no guarantee that we would ever respond to the cross or to the message of the good news that Jesus brought. Absolutely no guarantees that any of us would respond to that. Yet he comes in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us because he cares about lost people and he's willing to take a risk of even being rejected and not one soul coming to follow him. He's willing to take that risk because lost people matter to him. Jesus said it himself for the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's his whole reason for coming. 
He didn't come just to make us nicer people. He didn't come just to be an example of maybe what we ought to be and how we could be a little bit nicer than we are to each other. He came to seek and to save, to deliver those who are lost. And for Jonah, the people of Nineveh were wicked and lost and violent and they deserved punishment. And yet God comes with this gracious, merciful message and he sends this prophet to warn them of their sins and the coming judgment if they did not repent and they respond. And we see this great heart of God in chapter 4. Here's Jonah, as we read, sitting on a hill, fussed up about a, 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 little, a little plant and fussed fussing about the fact that the, the fireworks haven't begun against, against the, the people of Nineveh, that his prophecy is not being fulfilled, and he's angry with himself, he's angry with God, and he's embarrassed, and he's all upset because God is merciful and compassion. And yet we read about the God of the Old Testament who clear back to Exodus was described as the compassion and gracious God who is slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And we read in the New Testament, God is the very definition of love. Those who abide in love abide in God. Those who do not abide in God don't know anything about love. It's more than feelings. It's manifest in our actions. And God shows us this lavish, faithful love. In fact, you can't even define the love of God. It defies defiance. Even the poets, the songwriters have tried to describe it. I think of the song we, we used to sing more of. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? And were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Think about it. Have you experienced that love of God? Peter wrote these words. He said, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, listen to this, he loves us so much. He is patient with you, not wanting you to die in your sins and perish. But he wants everyone. He wants your children. He wants my children. He wants your neighbors to come to repentance. He doesn't want them, even though they're nice neighbors, they're lost. He doesn't want them to go into eternity without Jesus. He wants them to come to a change of their lifestyle. He wants them to come to repentance. He wants them to come to a change of mind that only God can bring. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but to repent. And come into relationship with him. He doesn't want people who just believe in him. Even the demons believe the Bible says. You can be a demon and believe in God. He wants them to come to a living relationship with him. In the good news. Lost people really matter to God. Do they matter to us? The second thing I notice in this is that, that your heart attitude toward the lost people, your heart attitude toward the lost people matters to God too. The great commission that Jesus gave us to go and make disciples, he sent us out. But too often in the church, we find it's the crew members on the cruise ship or the Ninevites who are pagans and wicked, they're the ones calling out to the God that we claim to serve, but we're, our heart is not in it. In fact, we miss their cries. We don't even hear their cries. We don't hear their prayers. We don't know what's going on in their lives because we're not tuned in. We, we, we pray, but we don't really pray and expect for deliverance to take place. Jonah felt like these people deserved to die, that he already had figured out what was going to happen to them. Well, they, they won't listen. They won't get around to getting saved. And it's very strange. Jonah finally does what God wants him to do, but he's not, his heart's not in it. He's going through the motions. 
He's probably been to the worship at the tabernacle and the temple many, many, many times. He pays his tithes and his offerings, but his heart is not about what Jesus is about. His heart is not about what God is about. His heart does not beat with what matters to God. He doesn't really care about lost people. He's just going through religious motions that hopefully will get him in a favor with God and get him to heaven. And we can end up doing the same. You remember Peter, after the resurrection, he had betrayed Jesus. He's living, he doesn't want to look Jesus in the eye. He's having a hard time being around Jesus at the breakfast supper after the resurrection on the beach. He's sitting there, and he says to Peter, hey, I got something for you to do, Peter. And Peter's going, you got something for me? Why would you even want, to, why would you even want me to do anything for you after all I've done? You can imagine the thinking, the shame, the condemnation. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly when he realized what he had done to Jesus. And he's sitting there at this breakfast. And Jesus says to him, I got a job for you. I want you to go feed my sheep. And he says it to him three times. And Peter can't believe it. And then, and then, and then Jesus gets real personal. He gets real personal. You know, you ever had Jesus get this personal? You just want to get up and walk out. You don't want to be there anymore. You don't want to hear the questions anymore. And he doesn't do it once. He does it three times. He says to Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter changes the word. And some of you know the Greek of that. There's two different words. And Jesus says, do you agape me? And Jesus says, oh, I'm a good friend of yours. And Jesus asked him again, do you really agape me? Do you, are you really committed to me and what matters in life between you and me? Does it really matter to you what matters to me? Do you love me fully, completely, without reservation? And Peter says, oh, you know, Jesus, I'm your good friend. He can't say the word, yeah, I'm fully committed to you. And finally, Jesus turns and looks at him and says, are you even a good friend of mine? And it says, Peter was offended. He got upset with Jesus. How dare Jesus? I've served you for three years. I've gone here. I believe in you. And you're, I know I'm not too good. And I've failed. And I've done that. But I'm trying to be a good friend of yours. He was offended. And yet Jesus said, I have a job for you to do. Jesus wasn't offended that he was offended. And he asked Peter, and, and what happened to Peter wasn't finished until the day of Pentecost. You see, he had to spend 10 days in an upper room, and he had to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit that would make them and give them the power to be witnesses and not be running and dodging and running away and loving lost people and loving Gentiles. He was going to have to learn to love Gentiles. He had to have the power of the Holy Spirit to do that because there was nothing in his culture, nothing in his upbringing, nothing in his home, nothing in his training that would teach him or would make him want to love Gentiles and to take the gospel to other places like Jonah was asked to go to Nineveh and the power of the Holy Spirit came on his life and he had to move in that direction and the question for us is what is our heart attitude toward lost people Jesus cares about your heart attitude toward lost people I had a colleague who recently told about traveling with a friend across Argentina a beautiful believer in Christ he said many of the times as we were traveling together in grueling places in planes and taxis and boats and whatever our travels took, it took us, he said this precious daughter of Christ, she would find some way to begin to share with somebody and eventually the conversation would go toward Jesus. She would share it and many times as she shared it, they would, they would reject it and she would come back with a frown. And then she would say, well, at least the seed has been planted. And my colleague friend said, yes, and God will make it grow. 
One of those trips, as they, they, they were talking, she ran into a young man and she began to share with him about Jesus and he was totally open to the gospel. And as she shared the gospel with him, she was able to pray with him and he made a commitment to Christ and she came back beaming from ear to ear and she said, that young man was so open to Jesus. My life. What is our heart attitude toward lost people? That's why Jesus had to say to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but they don't see it. The harvest is plentiful. Would you pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest field? And the disciples standing there going, it isn't harvest time yet. We don't see it. Jesus said, the crops are available right in front of you, ready for harvest, but you don't see it. Because your heart doesn't beat with what matters to God. Well, what do we do with the folks who are lost? Because God cares about the heart attitude of lost people. That matters to God, too. What is the, the heartbeat? Well, for the Ninevites, they, they, were, they, were, they were living out their lives and it would appear to the prophet of God that it was a waste of time to even be talking to them. They're going to be resistant. They aren't interested. They're, they're, they're just, in fact, maybe what Jonah was thinking was, when I get there, they're going to find a way to slowly kill me for even coming and intruding in their business and speaking words of, Judgment, which isn't a real popular message, and the words of deliverance. And see, what Jonah didn't know was that there was stuff going on in Nineveh he didn't know anything about. In fact, history tells us that in Nineveh, they were in the middle of a national crisis like they had never had before. And in this national crisis, they were suffering from a particularly hard famine. And the attacks of their enemies was increasing in their land. And they had internal revolutions and revolts and rebellions and insurrections going on in their government when Jonah was sent to them. In fact, there was a total eclipse of the sun in 763 B.C. at the very time that Jonah was sent to them. And very likely, these pagan people were thinking, the gods are mad at us and the judgment is coming. So they were already looking for the judgments of God because they were reading what was happening in the eclipse. And they believed that somehow that was a message from their gods that they were in trouble anyway. And then Jonah comes with this message that there is a God who's upset with the way you're living, but he wants to deliver you. They had never heard that message before before all they heard about was the judgment of the gods and they're running around trying to appease their gods with all kinds of sacrifices and food and Jonah comes along and said if you'll just repent the God of heaven will forgive you that was good news and when they saw all of that in the national national crisis that they were living in they repented of their sin. They changed their behavior. And the Bible says that the that the spirit of a contrite heart, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise, and he didn't despise it in them. That was the disposition of the Ninevites. And you see, too often we want to prescribe what the reaction of people is going to be because we don't know what's going on in their lives, but God does. He knows their heart condition. He knows what's happening. He knows why he's sending you to them today. He knows why he nudges you to speak a word into their lives. I had a call from a young man this week that I've been praying for for several years. He's away from God. And I just felt impressed to just back off for a while and just pray for him. Make contact with him every once in a while. He called me. There's some things happening in his life right now. And I could sense the power of God in answering prayer. The night of prayer we had the other night, his name was mentioned. And and I could sense that. And then he said this to me. He said, Lee Ray, I just feel so lost right now. And I was able to speak into his life. And he said, I watched a movie recently. 
And he told me the movie that God used to grab a hold of his heart. And he said, I don't know what else to do, but I've been, I've been reading the Psalms. Wow. God's at work. He knows the heart attitude of the people that he has you next to that's speaking into their lives. I had another mother call me from Maryland in the last few days. And she said to me, could you bring life skills out here? We got so much help from that. It's changed our whole life and our neighbors are seeing it. And they want, they want to get the information because we need God. They're seeing God in us in what we learned. Could you come because we're very lost in my neighborhood. My neighborhood is begging for somebody to speak hope into their brokenness. God knows. Jonah sits on a hill concerned about a plant. While 120 people are in mortal danger. Of going into eternity without God. And the question for us this morning is. Does what matters to God really matter to us? Or we have our mission statements. Together. Are we really together? I talked about that last Sunday. What does it mean for us to be together? There's a lot of churches in the culture right now that aren't together. They're fussing at each other. They're splitting. They're going their other directions. They're doing their own thing. Everybody's got an agenda. Together, we say, on the faith journey, and then we move from mission to vision. That's what God's calling us to do. If we are together on a faith journey, what makes us together? Well, it's Jesus. And if we're together on the faith journey of making disciples, then we reach, nurture, and develop seekers to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's, that's the vision. And we, we've got it right but how are we living it out? God's heart is a missionary heart. And it's been. It's not new. It's not. It didn't happen because of Jesus. God has a missionary heart that started clear back in Genesis in chapter 12. With a guy by the name of Abraham. When he said I want you to get up from all your pagan trappings and everything else. And I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And here's what's going to happen to you. In chapter 12 verse 1 through 4. This is what the Lord said to Abram. Go from your country. I'll make you a great nation. And I will bless you. And I'll make your name great. And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Did you notice how many times the word blessed is used in that? <laughs> Five times, depending on your translation. Five times. It's the same word that Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those. Happy are those. Blessed. Blessed are those. It's the same words that, that Jesus used when he called for the children to come to him in the synagogue. And they were, they were brought to Jesus and he blessed them. And his disciples got upset. They didn't want to have no service like that. And Jesus said, let them come. And he blessed the children. It's the same word. So could it be that God... Is trying to tell us something about how we reach into a culture that may be resistant to sharing our faith in a way that makes sense. And that we begin to listen and sense the heartbeat of God for the lost. And we begin to hear the cries of the lost who are waiting for somebody to intersect their lives. And we begin by blessing them. Well, how do we bless them? I put in your notes this morning. Here's, here's five things. The acrostic of the letter. I, I got it from David Ferguson, if you want to know. Say, who's that? Well, I just wanted you to know. I don't know him either. <laughs> but it's a great stuff. Begin with prayer. That's how Jesus began. 
And who, who do you begin with prayer with? Well, I put in your notes this morning eight lines. And here's what he suggests, that we write down eight of our neighbors, our family and friends, that we begin with prayer who are lost. Lost people. I got my list. These are mostly my neighbors. Do you know your neighbors by name? Do you know anything about them? What would happen if you got acquainted with your neighbors? Secondly, listen. Don't talk. First, learn to listen. Ask questions and listen to what they're saying. And listen for what God's doing in their lives the awareness of the needs that they're, the cry, you'll hear the muffled cry. They're not going to come out and say, I need God. They're, they're not going to come out and say, I'm lost. They're going to come out and tell you that they don't know, like, like one mother wrote or, or called me the other day and said, we've been to so many counselors and nobody has an answer for what we need. Do you have any word for us? We need God. That's what she said. I'm going. God's at work here. This is holy ground. Listen. That's what Jesus did with the blind man. He didn't just heal the blind man. You, you read about in, in, in Mark chapter 10. He said to the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? What do you need? He let the man. Well, Jesus already knew what he needed. But he let the man come to that awareness. What do you need from me? Well, I'd like to see my, I'd like to see. I'd like to have my sight. Jesus said, I can handle that. And begins to talk to them. And then E is for eat. Oh, we can all do that. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. He planned meals with them. He planned to go out with them, the lost people, and spend time with them and get to know them, eat with them. S is for serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. What is it that they have in their life that you could speak into their life or do something in their life that would serve them, like we're going to do with the single parent. We don't, we don't, we don't go to, some of these are, don't know Jesus at all. And we're not going over there with the four spiritual laws and bang them over the head. We're going to go serve them, ask questions and listen, and then enter the conversation, not awkwardly, but look for where God's already at work and where the, natural, the conversation flows naturally out of their own need. And then the last S is tell your story. That's what Jesus did in John chapter 14 when he began to tell Thomas. He said, well, we don't know the way to heaven. We don't know what's going on. And Jesus said, he told his story. You'll have to tell a different story. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except, that's my story. Do you know your story? If somebody says, well, I don't know how to come to Jesus. I don't know what eternal life. I don't even know if I believe in that stuff. Do you have your story ready? Or do you say, yeah, well, I hope you figure it out, buddy. Uh, just a minute. Let me call my pastor. He could probably answer that question for you. No. What's your story? What's your story? You say, I don't have a story. You need to get one. You need to get to know Jesus. You need to invite him in to become master, savior, leader, and lord of your life. And know the forgiveness of sin. And know the guilt that fall, falls off in the songs that we sing. It's not just a bunch of songs Pastor Stephen chooses. But it, it has meaning. It means something. When we sing these songs, you go, yeah, that happened to me. <laughs> and I remember when. <laughs> he forgave me. I don't know where I'd be today if it wasn't for Jesus. And all of us have a story. And somebody needs to hear your story of how you came to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They don't need to hear your story about how you came to the church. In fact, increasingly, nobody cares about your church. What they care about is, is do you have anything that's vital in relationship to Jesus because half the culture is sick and tired of the church. They hate the organized church. They hate what we're doing here this morning. They have no respect for it whatsoever. They don't want to hear about your church. They want to hear about Jesus. 
And then they'll listen to you about your church when they see a whole bunch of people who have a story about Jesus and that becomes the definition of the church. Then now, can I be a part of that? That's what God wants to do in their lives. Do you have names of 80 your neighbors? What would happen if you just wrote them down and said, I'm going to pray for them and then I'm going to start listening for the voice and the heart of God. And when he nudges me, I'm going to get to know them. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to listen. I'm going to eat with them. We're going to call, have them over for a barbecue in our backyard. We're going to listen, get to know them, laugh and have some fun. Listen to what their needs are. Serve them. And wait for the opportunity when they're asking the question that you have an answer to. Jesus. I don't know how you want to end this morning. But here's what I'm going to do. I've been praying for my neighbors for three years now. I'm still just getting to know some of them by name. And one of them doesn't want to have time of day. In fact, he'll, he'll run over me before he'd acknowledge I'm there. <laughs> doesn't feel real good. I wave anyway. I had a guy do that in the neighborhood I used to live in. And I kept praying for him. He didn't want to, he avoided me like the plague. He knew as a preacher, he didn't want nothing to do with me. One day I'm walking storm. On the other side of the street, he's raking in his yard. And I'm walking by and I'm praying for him. Even though I'm walking by that day. And all of a sudden, I hear a voice. Hey, Lee Ray, you remember my name. Would you pray for my dad? My dad's got some problems. And I'm thinking, buddy, the neighbors can hear this. Hey, can you pray for my dad? And I holler back, yes, I will. What can I pray for? And he hollered back and told me what he wanted me to pray for. I said, I really will be praying for your dad. Got an opportunity to speak into his life. He never did give his life to Christ. He moved away. But I still believe I may see him in heaven one of these days because a seed was planted and something happened because I listened. We close this morning. Maybe you want to write your names out. And come bring them to an altar of prayer. And just say Lord. I'm praying for my list here. You know where they're at. You know their hard attitude. You know where they are on the journey. You know some of them seem hard and impossible. And some of them seem open. And some of them profess to have some relationship. But their lifestyle doesn't look like it. I don't know anything about them. But I'm praying for them. As we sing this morning, maybe you'd just like to come and present your lists. Instead of sitting under a shade tree on a hillside, wondering what's going to happen to the crazy world we live in. And are we going to make it to the 2024 elections? What if we got less upset about that and started getting upset about lost people? What would happen? Let's sing together.